to talk about uh, climate-driven migration and climate-driven migration in the United States, uh, which is the subject of a, of a book that I just finished. Um, I'm going to give you sort of a, a crash course uh, download of my view of, of this issue, which I think is really one of the most consequential aspects of our uh, adapting to climate change and probably one of the least, uh, least discussed. Um, it's a very personal, it began at least as a very personal uh, story for me. I live in Northern California, so not too far from here, but just north of San Francisco. And in 2018, uh, we were in a second of, our, of a series of really bad fire seasons. Um, so just about 20 miles north of me was the Tubbs fire. Uh, so overnight, uh, uh, about 22 people died, 3,500 homes were built, were burnt. Um, and I woke up to, you know, inch to two inch long embers uh, piled on, you know, the windshield of my car. And uh, it was a very visceral experience and it was the first of, of many. Um, it was, a f uh, it, it really had me thinking about, you know, what would it take for me to move? How unsettled do I feel where I live? And then of course, like how do other people think about that around the world, not just, uh, you know, in, in my privileged California existence, but in Guatemala uh, or in Mexico or in South Asia. Um, so I'm gonna, Go real broad for a minute, and then I'll come back to uh, you know to what I see happening in the United States, which is really the focus of my book. Uh, but just to kind of start at uh, you know very very wide, uh, you know people have obviously always moved in response to their climate, um, from the earliest homo, sa homo sapiens moving out of Africa to the demise of uh, the Mayans to the settlement of Chinese herders moving northward into the Russian steppe. Uh, this has been the ultimate form of adaptation. Um, What's different now is that climate change is coming on quickly and dramatically, and the, op the population of the planet is unfathomably larger than it was. So 200 million people were on Earth when uh, Mayan civilization collapsed, 4 billion approximately when climate science started to become mainstream in the 1970s, 8 billion today, maybe 9 to 12 billion uh, by the end of the century, depending on you know, how, we, how we continue to evolve. So my questions were how many people, where, uh, when, and to where, uh, which are um, not simple endeavors to undertake. Uh, to, to begin to answer them, I worked with a team of scientists that published uh, the first of several really fascinating studies in this area in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 2020. And what they found, uh, which has been a cornerstone of a lot of my reporting, is that there is an optimal range for human life on this planet, uh, a climate niche, and it is shifting. Um, so for 6,000 years, the researchers found people have lived in a relatively small band of temperature and precipitation, uh, and that is now slipping towards the poles. And as it does, uh, people are being left behind. They're either moved out of that niche uh, or they're shifting into marginal zones. A few years ago, like just when the study was published, about 1% of the planet was considered too hot uh, for people to uh, comfortably live in, at least by that traditional measure. By 2070, their models estimate about 19% of the planet will be outside of that traditionally habitable zone. And that covers largely the equatorial regions of North Africa and Central and South America and South Asia. By later this century, depending on which trajectory of, of warming we follow um, and how much, of the planet's pop, how much the planet's population grows, that means two to six billion people will be outside of that optimal climate niche of habitability. So we're talking about a third to half of humanity. Only a fraction of those people will ultimately move, um, but the rest will endure some kind of hardship uh, where they live, and everybody will face that kind of decision that I began this project with, that question of uh, you know, how uncomfortable am I? How much can I sustain? When do I want to change my circumstances? And what uh, are my resources to change those circumstances? Um, and overall, this suggests that the, global, the total number of global climate migrants uh, will be orders of magnitude, I think, greater than all of the published estimates that are out there, which tend to range from you know, 10 to 50, maybe 200 million people. Um, I think it'll be much greater than that. I think we're entering into a, an era of permanent mass movement of, of populations. And this has already begun. Um, so those same researchers, they estimate that about 600 million people have already slipped outside of the climate niche globally. So when I try to gather all this and think about what that means for the United States, uh, which is, uh, so what I did, uh, it took a couple years uh, 
to research how those threats break down. I used a lot of maps like, uh, like Grace's that you just saw uh, and a lot of data I'll tell you about to try to visualize uh, you know, what this looks like in, uh, in North America and in this country. The threats break down into you know, kind of obvious wildfires in the West and sea level rise, extreme heat, humidity, and crop loss. Um, but these, of course, don't exist in, in isolation. They're compounding, um, they're overlapping, and they're amplifying one another. And as they do, they're transforming the comfort and the safety and the livability of vast parts of the United States as well. They're also transforming the economies of this country. Uh, they're promising a thorough transformation of the quality of life of the people here and the viability of these regions. And uh, as we'll talk about, I think the 10X corridor is among the most vulnerable, you just saw on those maps, about the most vulnerable of the regions in the United States. So the data suggests that farming will never be the same across this country. Labor productivity will shift dramatically. The cost of energy and demand for it will shift dramatically. Uh, and as we just heard with insurance, uh, the way that uh, individuals take on risk and manage their own risk financially uh, is changing dramatically. So to the core of my reporting to reach those conclusions uh, began with an effort to grab, uh, to gather really the best empirical data uh, that is available. And by empirical, I mean not just uh, data that reflects conditions that we think would probably cause people to move, but data that has been uh, empirically linked in other studies to drive migration um, and to see where those where the and to map that data and to see where it overlaps and to visualize geographically um, the multiple perils and these specific uh, threats around the country down to the county level uh, across the United States and I also went back to that climate niche that shift in global livability and worked with those researchers to map that niche for North America and for the United States which they hadn't done yet and understand where North America fits on that map and uh, what results is a story of a country with the walls closing in around it. Um, with crop failure and extraordinary wet bulb temperatures uh, piercing it right up the middle, uh, with water scarcity becoming nearly ubiquitous east to west, and pretty much the entire southern third of the country, the 10X corridor, um, slipping into marginal zones of that niche and beginning to fall outside of it. Some of these changes are really obvious. Wildfires encroach in the west, sea levels eat away at the coasts, uh, heat radiates from the south, but wildfires, um, they become prevalent across the southeast too. So Florida, for example, as well as South Carolina and Georgia, they become hot spots for mega fires in the future. And so does drought, which spreads from the drying Ogallala Aquifer to the Mississippi Sands Aquifer to the rivers throughout the southeast. Um, and sea level rise, as we heard earlier on the Mississippi, for example, can affect up to 150 miles inland. For the past several hundred years, the climate sweet spots uh, in this country have more or less saddled the middle of the country. They've stretched from Appalachia to the Rockies. It's why our southeast is verdant. It's why our plains and Midwest produce $35 billion worth of crops uh, and much of the grain to feed the world each year. But within the next five decades, these models suggest that sweet spot begins to shift uh, sharply northward. So under moderate emissions, like an RCP 4.5, now really the best case, best case climate scenario, that niche hovers over the northern Midwest and Chicago. Um, under a scenario of sharp warning, warming, uh, it moves all the way to the border of Canada and eventually to the other side of that border. The numbers of how many people are affected, this gets really fuzzy. Caution not to trust you know, uh, the, the specific numbers that come out, but roughly as many as 160 million Americans, or nearly half of us, can be expected to be pushed outside of that climate niche. As this happens, crop yields in the heartland drop between 30 and 90 percent. This is based on data sets that I worked with from the Rhodium Group and from uh, University of California at Berkeley. Uh, household energy costs in the south rise around 10 percent. Um, relative to their local economies and heating uh, in the north, relative to their local economies and relative to heating in the north. Um, mortality rates skyrocket. Crime rises in the north where uh, it's presumed that more people will migrate into, um, and so on. Nationally, economists estimate a loss of 1.2 percent GDP for the U.S. for every degree of Celsius warming from here on out. But at the county level, declines in GDP range from between 8 to 50 percent. And in some parts of Florida and Louisiana uh, and along the 10X corridor, that can be as high as 60 percent. So the next question for me is, what does this look like for American society? 
Um, first off, it suggests a sharp uh, and unequitable division of impacts along the same dividing lines that already define our society. Right? Climate impacts will cleave open the divides between rich and poor, between communities of color and white ones, between urban and rural ones. It'll exacerbate and underscore inequalities created by redlining, by discriminatory development and investment, and by unequal mortgage rates and interest rates. Communities that haven't received adequate investment in the past are gonna be the ones that fall behind more quickly in the future, and their infrastructure is going to be stressed like never before. Like I said before, not everyone who faces these impacts will move, that mobility is a function of their wealth, it's a function of age, it's a function of energy, and the opportunity they perceive in a new place. So while we can expect a certain number, a flight of a certain number of able people, uh, many people um, are likely to remain trapped uh, or will remain where they live by choice. And the risk is that some of these places will face a spiral of decline. That looks like a collapsing tax base that can lead to worse infrastructure still and higher climate risks still uh, with poorer schools and fewer jobs and opportunities for the people who live there. Lowering home values, the loss of assets, then more people leave, then the cycle perpetuates. So it can be kind of a grim cycle. The poor, the elderly especially, will be left behind. Uh, one of the researchers that I've worked closely with, a demographer at Florida State University, is finding that uh, in his models, the average age of residents in the hardest hits, hit communities, this is parts of Arizona, parts of Florida, jumps by 10 or 15 years uh, average age by around 2050. So one huge sets of set of challenges is around how policymakers, leaders, companies um, support these disadvantaged communities and begin to bend the odds to change their future opportunities and also how we care for these aging and uh, left behind communities and aid that transition of towns and cities that may remain but may shrink. How do we facilitate anti-growth? How do we diversify economies so that they're not disproportionately dependent on high risk sectors like agriculture in Texas, for example. And then what are the opportunities? Where are the places where people will go? What are the, what's the growth that can result from that movement? What are the investments that are gonna be safest in the future um, and contribute the most? The models and data that I look at suggest the population shifts towards relative safe havens in the Northeast and the Great Lakes and to a lesser degree in the Pacific Northwest. Um, there's climate threats in these, in these places. We saw that this summer with flooding in Vermont, for example. Uh, but there's also ample water in the absence of ma the main threats like wildfires and hurricanes and coastal flooding. There's also ample capacity. Think of t uh, cities like Detroit or across the Rust Belt, um, cities that have had uh, larger populations in the past than they have now and presumably the capacity then to take new people in. These broader regions, they might see an increase in crop yields while crop yields drop across so much of the rest of the country. They might see steady economies or even an increase in GDP while GDP is projected to decrease across the 10X corridor, for example, and the southern part of the country. Um, they'd see a relative reduction in energy costs and they'd see increases in later pro labor productivity. So regionally, that trend would also mean a consolidation of urbanization uh, so in the south, in the 10X corridor, for example, it's possible that instead of everybody leaving, uh, that cities like Phoenix or Houston, they become islands. Uh, they grow immensely as rural areas or smaller communities, communities that don't have the sustainable economies to support their populations begin to, to empty out and people move to the closest uh, economic uh, thriving zone next to them. So all of this presents another set of challenges, um, mainly around urban growth and planning. How do you support the needs of a growing influx of population? Um, the researcher who modeled for me uh, the aging demographic of Florida also uh, modeled for me uh, an estimate of a 50-fold increase in population in places where migrating people move into. So there is this like amplifying effect. So if, to, if uh, 10 people move and migrate and then their family joins them a couple years later and they require new services and uh, a couple people move there to open a coffee shop to serve them and so forth. The net result of that is a 50-fold increase in these receiving communities. Those communities need jobs, they need transit, they need housing, they need education. Um, and it's the same old challenges that we've faced for a long time but amplified in this new context. All of this is obviously a daunting picture. We talked a little bit yesterday about avoiding the doomsday scenario. Um, 
but it is also just uh, a pointer to a lot of hard work. And the monumental sets of tasks laid out ahead of us, ahead of us they're pretty well defined. They're straightforward. They're well within our technological capabilities. Um, and I think we're at a bit of a moment. Uh, so closing thought here is that you know, I think we're at a, at, a, at a sort of a break in the storm. We've tasted a bit of the consequences of climate change, uh, and we have also a taste of the progress. We've passed some laws and we've made some pledges that would slow down those consequences, and we've seen that while they're not totally painless, they're possible, and that they have an effect, right? 80% of new energy installation is now renewable, for example, or we're seeing the EV mar battery uh, market taking off in the US and some of the other achievements that we talked about earlier today. So what's crucial is the speed in which this work happens uh, makes all the difference in the severity of the change that we just talked about. If the premise is that pain plus mobility equals mass migration, uh, and I think this is kind of the new state of, of normal, uh, it's also clear that cutting emissions uh, reduces all of the impacts that I just described. The estimates for total population movement outside of the US or that from that, global, from that uh, moving climate niche would drop by 80% if we can achieve 1.5 degrees as opposed to two or two and a half degrees of warming. And inside, that sh inside the US, that shift is discernibly different with lower emissions. It stays, that ideal climate uh, niche stays closer to the middle of the country and supports the 10X corridor a little bit better. So long-winded, those are my thoughts, and I, uh, I guess we'll have a conversation about it. But. Yeah, here's what, uh, you know, Ed, I think it says on the front of your, uh, brochure, an observatory for the future. We think we're pretty good observers. I can read a room. <laughs> I sense that uh, people have uh, uh, experienced a lot of great thoughts today and that can absorb only so much. So I'm gonna keep my questions just to three to, for Abram. We don't even have to get up on the stage. You can stay right there. Um, first of all, uh, we have heard some other stats today. You lay it out as starkly as anybody does. This is tough stuff. How do you personally digest the information you're getting, write about it, talk about it, and what does it do to your own thinking about where you need to be? I think uh, I, we're both fathers, you have younger children, my children are a little bit older. How does this impact you professionally and personally? Uh, I compartmentalize a lot, I think, probably just to, <laughs> right, just to, just to maintain some semblance of, of uh, of mental health, um, but as I said, it's a it's it's a personal. This is a personal project. It's a personal process. Um, it's not an easy one. So you know, I mean, my own story with regards to everything that I just said is that I've been constantly deliberating uh, my own move. Do I want to live on a farm in Vermont? Do I want to keep living in the San Francisco Bay Area? Uh, I've been working on this project for almost five years. A book for three. I haven't moved yet. Um, but you, in the book, you do actively talk about it, and you certainly talk about the neighbors who talk to you about when they should go. I mean, and, it's a real thing. And when me. I started writing the book, I thought that I would have moved by the time I finished it, and I thought that I would write about that. Uh, so uh, all that to say that it's an organic process, and it draws on for a long time. Um, you know, and as I traveled around the world talking about what makes people feel like they need to move uh, in, as part of this project, I mean, one of the lessons that I, you know, that I take away is that it, migration is a really complex thing, and it's a, so it's a complex thing personally, um, but it's not just dependent on how smoky, smoky the air is or how bad the hurricane is. It is also affected by what opportunities I see, how urgent those threats feel, uh, what, you know, um, violence or crime I might face in my community. Um, I don't personally, but, um, you know, Lots but of people you, you do, do mention that in the book that uh, things when they break down they break down and you have stats proving that when these things happen unfortunately things get a little bit ugly yeah yeah, yeah. I, you know and I think I would just say we all everybody in this room who thinks about climate change a lot also bears some of this burden and sometimes it's good to just um, take a breath and realize that we're all sort of carrying uh, you know carrying the weight of, of this issue around and so I come back to that compartmentalization you know I try to handle it. Um, intellectually and thoughtfully, and then I shut it off, and I go for a bike ride, or I pick up the guitar, or uh, or I hang out with my kids, um, yeah. and I just put it aside for a minute. Or you go to the Grammy Museum, or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> something like that. So, <laughs> so, so here's my last thought, and I'm thinking of Julie. Is Juliet back there? Yes, she is. There she is. 
You mentioned places like Detroit, one of my favorite cities. I always consider Detroit, New Orleans, and Phoenix the big three, in that all of them could see their unfortunate fate ahead of them. Detroit watched itself for decades, lose population, lose industry, whatever, and you get these crumbling buildings as a representation of our failure to see what was happening and or to take moves to prevent it. Uh, in New Orleans, hurricane comes every year. It's a big one, there's a little one. It can see that, and when Katrina came, it came, that was no surprise. Phoenix, it's a slow drip, but nevertheless, it's a, it's a disaster in some kind of motion. So we know stuff, and you're talking about the Midwest, hey, maybe Detroit might have a second coming. Ann Arbor, where Juliet is, and, and others. So if you think that's the place, and you talk in terms of like 20, 25, 30 years, that's right around the corner. Could you imagine the counterpoint to Ten Across, which could suggest, you know, you might want to get out of there. What do you do to the area of the country that could absorb 10 million, 20 million, 100 million, couple hundred million people. Should that area of the country have its own ten across project of a sort to get ready for the migration that you're predicting? Why do we not, if we can see this is going to happen, as our friend Jeff Goodell told us about heat, it's never going to get cooler. In our lifetimes, it's never going to get cooler. It's only going to get hotter. If you can see this migration, should there be an active macro planning process to anticipate migration? Yeah, absolutely. Um, 80 across? Yeah, or, <laughs> and there are, some, there are some really thoughtful thinkers who have said, you know, we should look at the Great Lakes on either side of the border as one massive, if you will, park. And I mean that provisionally park. I mean, look at it holistically and imagine what it is and how it will grow and how it should adapt to that. Yeah, I mean, I think that's smart, and I think that that um, would be really beneficial. Uh, unfortunately, it seems like it's a little ways off. It's not widely recognized yet that this is happening. Uh, it's more of a spotty recognition. I spent time with people in Ann Arbor, for example. Uh, the city was going to spend a couple million dollars more than it needed to for its new uh, sewage infrastructure system, anticipating the growth that it would get uh, as a result of climate migration. Um, but I also participated recently in a uh, sort of a war game exercise in Washington uh, at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, exploring how cities in the United States could prepare for, you know, for uh, the kind of influx of population that we're talking about. And uh, it was incredibly challenging. It was like all of the old arguments would just keep going but go deeper. There was very little consensus about whether you would spend the limited money you have you know, on new affordable housing or on new streets or on a new park uh, or on schools or whatever. And it wasn't clear that those conversations were going to get any easier, that they were just going to get harder. And those conversations kind of devolved um, pretty quickly in that scenario. Um, so it's a little um, uh, uh, discouraging. Uh, one of the focuses, one of the case studies I look at in the book is the city of Atlanta, and one, there's a lot to say about Atlanta in terms of its population growth and climate migration, but one of the phenomena in Atlanta is that uh, as progressive as the city has tried to be in some sustainable ways, it has no control over um, the cities adjacent to it, and so that there, it's sort of an example of this um, inability to cohes coherently manage these challenges across a region which really begs for, I think, you know, some strong federal role. People have suggested like a migration czar, a climate czar uh, at a cabinet level position that can coordinate some of these efforts across the country. Yeah, and, and I'll just close by saying when Katrina came to uh, New Orleans, obviously people retreated to Atlanta. A lot of them went short to Baton Rouge, but a lot went to Houston and elsewhere. And for the most part, people were welcoming for a while. Saw an uptick in crime, a few other things. And so the thought of an in-migration of a whole bunch of strangers is not easy to think about. It's, for a lot of people, wildly disruptive, if not worse. And so it's not only the technical aspects, it's just, wow, really? That's what's going to happen? I'd prefer not to imagine that. And I think it just makes it all the much harder. And the more that cities and communities can plan and prepare for that before it happens, the more capacity they'll have to uh, to absorb those people before the pressures start to feel overwhelming yeah. Yeah. in that way. Um, the less action that we take you know, up front, the more quickly we're going to get to that crisis point. Well, I appreciate everybody's forbearance with the technical problem we had today, which slowed us down by about 15 minutes and makes the day feel considerably longer. 
But uh, I want to thank Abram. The whole point of Ten Across is the meetings that we have in between these conversations. So I hope you will take Abram uh, aside at the Grammy Museum on the deck that we're going to have a nice uh, event at and ask him more about what he's doing. The book comes out in March, if I'm not mistaken. End of March. Yep. End of March. We'll have another event for that. Uh, because I think it's going to be a widely talked about book because of the implications in it. And so we'll certainly take advantage of Abram's uh, intelligence as well at that time. So Abram, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thank you.